Hello and welcome to another installment of History Hack. Alina, tell us, who do we have today? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce to you Dan Kazida, who is a historian and a journalist specialising in chemical warfare. His book will be published, well, Corona pending, in late August, which we are very, very excited about. Welcome, Dan. Well, thank you for having me. And your ex-Secret Service as well, right? Yes, I did, uh, I did six years in the U.S. Secret Service that uh, protects the president and the White House from chemical, biological, radiological hazards. Um, my CV reads a little bit like a cheap novel. Um, but yes, I've been working in this whole sort of protecting people from that sort of hazard for basically 30 years in one way or another. That's amazing. Who was your president? Well, I should say, I actually had two different jobs at the, at the White House. Uh, so I, over the course of 12 years, I, had, I worked under Bill Clinton and George Bush Jr. That's I left amazing. in 2008. Yeah. This isn't my first disaster, this current uh, pandemic. I mean, I went through the whole sort of 9-11, evacuate the White House thing, and immediately followed by the anthrax uh, stuff. But maybe we save that for another podcast, because I got Absolutely. interesting stuff to say about all that, too. Oh, hell yes, I'm we totally... definitely. <laughs> Where are you I'm now? Going for that. I'm in London, you know, in a very, very quiet, peaceful London. I've never heard it so quiet before, not even in the middle of the night. How's lockdown for you? Um, a little bit stir crazy. I mean, I'm, you know, I live in a nice part of London where at least I have access to lots of small shops. I mean, uh, you know, the joke here in Pimlico is that the Tesco has always been the Soviet Tesco, long queues and no food. Even before the pandemic, there was never anything in it. <laughs> uh, but I could scrounge just about anything I could imagine in the, in the local neighborhood here. So, you know, if anybody needs anything, you know, get in touch. I'll, we'll make a deal. <laughs> awesome. Uh, okay. I want to ask, before we start with anything in this book, I have a bone to pick with you. Why didn't you cover World War One? Alex, Alex, hold on, hold on, <laughs> hold on. Wait a minute. We're going to be starting our questions with World War One because we can't do World War Two without World War One. So let's <laughs> kick yeah. it off by okay. asking Dan <laughs> to briefly talk us through about chemical warfare in, wait for it, World War One, and what kinds of chemicals were actually used. Okay, so... There's a couple things here. First of all, you know, the reason why my book doesn't really go into World War One except as background is I, my book actually is a history of nerve agents and nerve agents didn't get invented until the 1930s. But that leads to an interesting story about why and how they got invented, which we'll get to shortly. Um, talking about World War One, uh, chemical warfare, all that, I mean, chemical warfare was one of a number of technical inventions in, in warfare that made their debut in the First World War, along with things like aircraft, submarines, uh, certain things have been used before like machine guns and all that, but this is really where modern technological warfare really, you know, manifested itself in a lot of different ways. And one of these was chemical warfare. Uh, chemical warfare was initiated by the Germans in 1915, uh, quickly copied by the French and the British, uh, poorly, badly copied by several other countries, uh, the idea being that this could break the deadlock uh, on the Western Front. And people often forget about the Eastern Front in the, uh, in the First World War. And Germany also felt that the use of chemicals ag against a numerically superior Russian army could reduce the Russian army's uh, manpower advantage. Okay, It could make up for the fact that uh, the Russians had a lot more soldiers. Uh, so chemical warfare started out in, you know, actually very early in 1915 with a battle on the Eastern Front that nobody remembers anymore, with a, chem a chemical that nobody even talks about, something called xylyl bromide, and it actually didn't do anything. It didn't work. Um, this is kind of a recurring theme because you get chemicals that, you know, scientists in the laboratories say, hey, this is dangerous. This is nasty stuff. You could go kill a lot of people with this. And then what you get is the practical reality in the, uh, in the trenches or on the uh, Eastern Front is that you know, chemicals don't live up to their actual, you know, reputation. So despite the fact that we have this massive popular culture, you know, image of the First World War and mustard gas and chlorine and all this stuff, and, you know, millions died from it, actually, 
Um, the amount of fatalities from chemical warfare in the First World War is a, is, is a drop in the bucket compared to the numbers dead from bullets and artillery and disease and all the other things that normally go on in warfare. Uh, so it's really hard in the First World War to point to a single battle anywhere where chemical warfare was decisive. It was arguably a, a contributing factor in a couple of places, uh, but it, you know, the chemicals used in the First World War didn't, didn't win battles. They didn't win the war for anybody. Uh, they, uh, they just tended to make life more miserable for the poor guys having to fight the war. So what did you... Um, Germany learned a couple things. Uh, I, I would say that there was a, looking at the German military mentality, there was a majority view that chemical warfare wasn't worth it, okay? Uh, that it was a waste of ammunition, okay? Because it took something like, on average, it took about 25 chemical artillery shells fired to achieve a single casualty. That's the statistical average from the First World War. So there was this majority view that said, you know, this really is not worth the, the pain in the ass. It's not worth the logistics. Uh, it's just, we can't be bothered with it. Uh, the minority view was that, well, we just don't have it dialed in right yet. You know, we, ha we aren't using the right chemicals. We need to do more research on the best ways to disseminate them. Uh, you know, we need to do a better job of this. And then we can, you know, we can just get some better chemical weapons out there. We can win the chemical battle. Um, and that same discussion was going on in all of the armies. That same discussion went on in the Russian army, in the French army, the US army, the British army, the Italian army. This went on and basically at the end of the war, every army has got this majority minority split going on. So moving into the 20s and 30s, you know, everybody is preparing for the next war. Uh, at the same time that there's going on, and particularly in the 20s and early 30s, there's relatively optimistic international diplomacy going on. Uh, there's an international treaty, the Geneva Protocol, which doesn't ban chemical warfare and chemical weapons outright, but bans first use. However, it allows countries to research, develop, maintain chemical stockpiles for retaliatory purposes. So basically, all the small, medium, large sized countries out there with any kind of resources have some kind of chemical warfare program going on in the 20s and 30s. Uh, some you don't even think about now, like the Swedes or the Czechs or, uh, you know, Poland, for example, had a small chemical warfare program in the 20s and 30s. So everybody's got this based on the I idea that, well, we have to have it to deter the other guys from having it, because if we don't do it at all, you know, we can't retaliate in kind. So there was this idea of retaliation in kind and deterrence going on. Now, there's also this minority working in most of these countries, you know, we're, uh, particularly active in Germany, particularly active in the Soviet Union on researching newer and better things. Okay, uh, poorly resourced because we're talking about the we're well, we're talking about the Great Depression here. We're talking about the height of collectivization in the Soviet Union. So these are not efforts with a huge amount of resources behind it, but there are these research programs sort of creaking along in military research institutes to try to make the stuff from the First World War better. Then interesting things start to happen. So moving away from the First World War, we're now in the 1920s, we're now in the 1930s. Can you talk us through more about Germany in the 1930s and its rearmament? Okay, so Germany understands that it is easily blockaded. It no longer has a colonial empire that it can import things from. Uh, it understands that it has to be able to fight the next war when it comes with what it has in hand, okay? And so this, this leads to a couple interesting things. Uh, and I'm, I, you'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. It means that, for example, it cannot reply, rely heavily on imported food. So it has to be able to protect its own domestic food supply because armies fight on the stomach. Uh, much of the reason why the Germany collapsed when it did in 1918 is the, you know, the army and the Navy were starving. I mean, literally the Navy was starving and, you know, rebelled. The Kriegsmarine had all these mutinies. Uh, so protecting the domestic food supply is important, but also uh, 
eking out your scarce supplies of uh, petroleum products. Now, into this mix comes uh, the German chemical industry. Right? Uh, the German chemical industry in the 1920s had been quite heavily consolidated. Uh, I think a lot of people overlook how sort of the how socialist, for example, uh, Weimar Germany was in a lot of ways. There was a there was a lot of consolidation of industries and things like that. There was talk of nationalization, all that didn't quite happen. But what did happen was six major chemical companies got shoved together to form this uh, IG Farben chemical conglomerate that amounted to eighty or ninety percent of the chemical industry in Germany. Uh, they were tasked with interesting things like uh, let's find ways to use our own domestic minerals to replace things that rely on imported petroleum. Because if we fight another war, we're going to need that petroleum for tanks. We're going to need it for airplanes. We're going to need it as fuel for the submarines. Um, so, yeah, domestic products that are, are made out of petroleum, let's find other ways to make them. Another thing they're working on is better ways of protecting agriculture. Let's make better fertilizers. Let's make better pesticides because, you know, if we have an infestation of the, uh, the uh, Colorado potato beetle, there goes the potato crop. They were absolutely terrified of the Colorado potato beetle. Um, this is why the first, book, uh, first chapter of my book is called The Axis of Weevils. So what you have here is that you have this odd confluence of people working on pesticides, people working on ways to get off of petroleum and all the good pesticides at the time were either you know based on petroleum or, or used petroleum as a solvent like kerosene to uh, uh, to spread it. So you've got a cluster of scientists who are taking some theoretical work that had been done before the Nazi era and then in this early, early Nazi era here we're talking sort of 1934, 35, 36 are starting to work on things. Okay, they're trying to make better pesticides because they want to protect the, the domestic crops. So this sort of soup, if you will, this big pot of things stirring up, uh, accidentally leads to the a far more effective chemical warfare agent, the nerve agents. I'm so, I'm so glad you explained that chapter heading to me because I thought I was losing my mind when I read it because um, it's the kind of sad joke I'd make. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to know that my brain isn't the only one that goes there. But tell us, who is Dr. Willie Lang and why is he so important in this narrative? Um, Willie Lang uh, inadvertently is the father of organophosphates. Organophosphates are a class of chemicals. Uh, still to this day used in a lot of pesticides. Uh, he did a lot of work in the late 20s, early 30s. Uh, not just him, uh, several of his graduate students, uh, Gerda von Kruger was an, uh, a rarity, a female, uh, a female PhD candidate under him at the time. Uh, he did a lot of the theoretical underpinning that worked out the chemical reactions that could be made to make this new category of chemicals called organophosphates. Now, really long himself, uh, you know, he, he ended up, he ended up do, doing some interesting stuff, but he wasn't a Nazi. In fact, his, his wife was Jewish. Uh, because of that, he ended up basically losing his job and emigrating. So he ended up going to the U.S., uh, ended, up in, uh, ended up in Ohio, ended up working for Procter & Gamble, the uh, industrial conglomerate, ended up working on toothpaste. Uh, in fact, one of the very, he is one of the people responsible for the fact that fluoride is in toothpaste. And fluoride, uh, he worked out that you could, A, put fluoride into toothpaste in a way that is going to be toxic to people, and B, that fluoride is actually good at preventing tooth decay. So there are probably billions of teeth that are still in people's mouths around the world because of Vililanga. Uh, but he also left this body of theoretical work that was available, you know, published in scientific journals that could be picked up by these guys a few years later in IG Farben, who are looking at ways of getting rid of weevils, aphids, potato beetles, things like that. How, what kind of a role does IG Farman play in all of this? And um, in your, because I've read, I've read your book, but Dr. Paul, I'm going to say this wrong, Dr. Paul, 
Paul Gerhard, oh my God, this guy has a really long name. Dr. Paul Gerhard, Gerhard Heinrich Schroeder. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dan, for putting us all out of our misery there. <laughs> <laughs> what role does he, um, that dude <laughs> what role does that dude play in the development of new chemicals because because we obviously we know that uh that dr willie langer he's he's the creator of all of this so it kind of now the ball starts rolling so what does dr paul i'm going to call him dr paul what does dr paul gerhard play? he looks yes. like gerhard is all uh dr schroeder uh he he's a very good chemist all right uh, he works for IG Farben uh, in one of their labs. Uh, he is trying to find better pesticides. And he is, look, he is looking at this theoretical, theoretical work that was done by, by Dr. Lange. And he starts systematically making hundreds of chemicals from scratch. Now, a lot of these chemicals had never existed. They had never been, had never been synthesized. And he's working through this entire family as best he can of organophosphates to find chemicals that have all the right characteristics to be useful as pesticide products. Uh, and it can't just be something that uh, uh, kills bugs because if it's so dangerous that it kills the farmer, that's no good. Uh, if it's so dangerous that it contaminates the farmland, that's no good. If it's explosive, if it's, you know, corrosive, uh, you know, if it destroys the plants, if it catches fire, all these things are bad for pesticides. So he's working, so he's, he's taking a theoretically a family of thousands of chemicals and sort of winnowing it down to ones that are useful in the field. And literally in the field in this case. Uh, and he stumbles across a chemical which, became the first military nerve agent. Uh, it later became something called Taboon. It had a number of different code names, LE100, P100. Um, the nomenclature for this stuff gets very complicated very quickly. Uh, he found a very good pesticide, but even in basically almost homeopathic type dilution, it was still too uh, dangerous to use. Uh, it made him quite ill actually, even in very small amounts. Uh, he sent this off to uh, one of his uh, one of his colleagues for safety testing, and it very quickly killed all the test animals. Uh, so this is this is something that you know, actually, it was a bit of a disappointment to him. You know, this is too dangerous to work on in the factory, really, or at least the current factory. It's too dangerous to use as a pesticide. This is a bit of an industrial reject. However, his management is privy to something that he's not. His management says, ah, I think the government, these new Nazi uh, landlords we have in Berlin uh, might be interested in this because they are looking for new and better chemical weapons. Uh, there was a secret decree from the, uh, from the Nazi government, uh, basically a hunting, a hunting permit out to industry saying, this is all the things we're looking for. We want to make better ball bearings. We want better batteries to go into submarines. We want lighter radios to go into airplanes. There were a list of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of things that the rearmament effort for Germany wanted. Okay. And buried somewhere on this list is uh, chemicals that make good poisons that might be useful in, you know, uh, on the battlefield. And this new chemical taboon very much, uh, hit that requirement because it wasn't flammable. It wasn't explosive. You know, it was a liquid, it was a liquid at room temperature. So you could put it in an artillery shell or a bomb, you know, quite easily. Uh, it was actually easily 20, 30, 40 times more toxic than, you know, by weight than anything developed in the first world war. Um, so it met a lot of these requirements. Now, on the other hand, it was actually devilishly hard to make. Uh, so IG Farben sent a delegation up to uh, up to Berlin. Just outside of Berlin is is a place called Spandau, and Spandau Citadel in the old castle there was where the German army had its. They call it the gas protection laboratory, and these were the these were the scientists who actually worked for the German army who were you know working on this stuff. And these guys were amazed, dumbfounded, stunned to see this stuff, and said, Ah. We'll give you guys a contract to produce more of this so we can investigate it. And why don't you work out how to, you know, maybe. So you've already mentioned animal testing. Um, who were the test subjects yeah. when they really start going on this? Um, 
Well, believe it or not, um, volunteers. <laughs> you know what? What they had? What they had was uh, most most of the testing happened out at this place called Raubkammer. Uh It's near Munster. It was it's the German Army's proving ground and artillery training site. So it's out in the it's out it's out in the middle of the forest. There's large impact areas where you can launch artillery shells. I mean, most of it was done with animals. Um, most of it was done according to you know, pretty much the ethics of the day. Uh, we're talking about the German army here, not the SS. So they're not trotting out prisoners or anything like that. Uh, they had a fair bit of human case studies from accidental exposures because it took very little of this stuff to leak out to cause people to get ill. Okay. Uh, but most of the stuff going on, most of the stuff going on out at Derab camera was on dogs and cats. Uh, occasionally things like chickens and stuff like that, but mostly dogs and cats. Um, very interestingly, uh, an, an underlooked aspect of the uh, of the Holocaust was the fact that quite early on, Jews were prohibited from owning house pets. So dogs and cats were being confiscated from from Jewish families. You know, uh, so there was a plenty of supply of dogs and cats that went to their went to their doom in Raubkammer. Although I have to say, there was some very looking at the the, the testing records. There's some cats who really were like nine lives and like very very lucky um it, my publisher was amazed uh, that i could involve cats in this he says if i can involve nazis and cats in the same book it's going to be a bestseller i think, I think he may have, have a point happy. yeah <laughs> no because i like cats i like cats i don't want to hear about them getting gassed uh but no i think your publisher's got a point there how did they get this product re ready for use so they're testing it what happens next well, there, there's a, there's a, there's a, we're talking about sort of 1938, 1939 now. They are still working out the way to mass produce it. Uh, the, the German government, you know, the, the, the Wehrmacht has placed orders for sort of like one ton quantities of this. Uh, they've set up a, what they call a pilot scale production facility uh, out at Raubkammer. Uh, to make quantities for testing, but not true mass production, because there's a lot of steps to this, to make this stuff. And going from what Gerhard Schroeder had worked out on the, on the bench top to full production is a real pain. There's a lot of dangerous steps. In fact, a lot of the intermediate steps are far more dangerous than the nerve agent itself, because you're talking about stuff that is, you're talking about th stuff that's really going to like blow up and like, you know, corrode things. And, you know, you know, uh, some of the intermediate chemicals are more dangerous than the than the nerve agent itself. Uh, so they're but they're working they're working out the manufacturing process to make this taboon. Uh, but while this is going on, Gerhard is back in his lab, discovering interesting pesticides. He occasionally comes across chemicals that are even more dangerous. So the second nerve agent, which we know as sarin, uh, is far more deadly than taboon. Uh, evaporates more quickly, so it it, it evaporates into a, a vapor form quite quickly, uh, but is even harder and more expensive to manufacture. So until the war starts in September 1939, what you have is you have a nerve agent that's bad, uh, and they're kind of working out how to make it, and you got another one that's every bit of three or four years behind it in the development timeline. Now the war happens. You've just jumped into my next question and on my line of thought, really. So about Poland in 1939. So I'm going to cut you off just a touch and add in the question while you're, well, not while you're speaking, because now I'm speaking. Um, <laughs> but was, <laughs> was chemical warfare actually used in the invasion of Poland? So just to, just to add that into your, into your uh, thing. There, the answer is yes, but not in a widespread manner. Um, there is, a, there is an anecdotal story, and I don't know if there's any truth to this at all or not, and I've not been able to get to the bottom of this. There's an anecdotal story that uh, a Luftwaffe ground crew accidentally loaded a, a few mustard gas bombs onto a, onto a bomber instead of conventional ones, and they got dropped somewhere outside of, of Warsaw. Um, don't know if that's true or not. Uh, but what I do know is true is that there was an incident in a place called Yaslo, 
okay, where the Polish army had a small quantity of actually quite diluted mustard gas. Now, mustard gas, despite its name, is not a gas. It's actually an oily liquid. Uh, they had left over from a training exercise a very diluted amount of mustard gas and some chemical landmines and used several of these to, to try to delay the advance of the German army. Uh, so several German soldiers got heavily injured by the mustard gas. Uh, some people on both sides were trying to make some propaganda out of it. Uh, the, actually, interestingly enough, the people that ended up sort of quashing the whole story were actually the German army, who really didn't want to go down this whole chemical warfare route anyway, uh, went and launched an investigation, uh, went and looked into it quite heavily and really realized that this was a local amateur effort. It wasn't some sort of official change in policy by the Polish government. Then the whole thing sort of like gets sort of lost in the dust of war. You get into the Cold War era, nobody talks about it, or if you do, it gets painted as propaganda. It's anti-Polish propaganda, it's anti-German propaganda, it's anti-whatever. As best I can tell, the incident actually happened. But it was like, actually what happened, it was an, it was an, amateur, it was an amateur effort with a couple of gallons of actually quite, not quite safe stuff, but very diluted mustard agent. And so it was an isolated, it was an isolated incident. Uh, I don't think that the Germans really were very keen on entering into the whole chemical warfare thing. Uh, so uh, the German high command kind of jumped on this Yazoo incident and, you know, tried to clamp it down as much as possible. Well, I mean, Blitzkrieg was quite effective enough on its own, really, wasn't it, without needing uh, chemical warfare added into the mix? Just oh, exactly. No, and, and Germany at this point didn't have the nerve agents. They had nerve agents as sort of, you know, bucket quantities. They didn't have it in many tons uh, because lit literally as this Yaslo incident, accident, whatever you want to call it, is happening, this is literally the same point at which IG Farben is in these commercial meetings in Berlin where the contracts are being let, right? Now the valves for the money are, are flowing. Albert Speer has been put in charge of the German economy and he's putting you know, the, the equivalent of billions of dollars or pounds or euros, he's putting billions into IG Farben to mass produce chemical uh, weapons in a way they hadn't been doing up to this point. Can I ask you, um, what about other countries? Where do we stand with other combatants in World War II um, and developing nerve agents? Ah, nobody developed a nerve agent. Nobody did. This is a complete, this, you know, the, the, everybody else in the Second World War is pretty well stuck with what they had from the First World War. Uh, the, these nerve agents were an absolute radical shift, okay? Uh, and nobody, nobody knew that the Germans were onto this stuff. Um, now, you ask an interesting question about what about the war, all right? People forget that the war has actually been brewing for a little while over in China, all right? This idea that the Second World War really started only on the 1st of, uh, 1st of uh, September, 1939, kind of, a, kind of a, well, completely ignores several years of very active warfare in China between the Chinese and the Japanese, okay? Now, so much so that some historians actually try to paint that as a separate war entirely. Uh, you know, I'm not gonna get it, I'm, I'm not gonna get into that argument, but, in that war, uh, there's a lot of chemical warfare going on, and it's the Japanese putting an awful lot of chemical weapons onto Chinese people, both military and civilians. Tell us some more uh, about that. So, well, I I'm going to be the I'm going to be the first to to tell you I'm not a huge expert on on that aspect of of of, of the war because it's not very well written about in, in, in English. Uh, and it's something that, you know, Japan only now is coming to terms and starting to actually admit that it actually did. So if you were to ask this question 20, 30 years ago, uh, Japanese people would say, no, no, it never happened. Okay. Uh, and, or would accuse the Chinese of you know, trying to score propaganda points and all that. But there was actually relatively prolific use of, uh, of, uh, of chemical weapons in a lot of different, in a lot of different battles. Um, but because this is happening in obscurity to the rest of the world, you know, uh, it's not terribly well documented. It wasn't documented well at the time. Uh, it certainly isn't documented well now. Uh, but it is, I think, 
Now, I'm just going to speculate here. My own speculation is actually more people died from chemical warfare in the Second World War than, than certainly died on the Western Front in the First World War from chemical warfare. But we don't really know because even the Chinese themselves have no idea what casualties they incurred because they, they just didn't keep the records. I mean, to, to, to recap, the, the, the chemical warfare that was going on on the Japan-China front, we know it was happening, but the exact depth of that, uh, we can only really kind of guess at in a lot of ways. And some of, it, some of it still has implications today because to this day, the Chinese are still covering, uncovering old unexploded munitions containing things like mustard gas. So uh, it does happen, you know, and the Japanese have admitted it and spend a lot of money, you know, remediating these things when they do get found in China. So I mean, that's that's a story yet to be told. But, uh, so this this idea that you know chemical warfare wasn't a thing in the Second World War uh, is kind of right if you just look at Europe. And it's not at all right if you look at the Pacific and, and the China front. You know, so you know, uh, and of course, then 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 of course in the whole uh, Germany experience. You know, I know what you're going to ask me next, Eileen. You're going to ask me. You're gonna, you're going to ask me about you know the the Holocaust where that fits in all this. Exactly. Do you know what it is? While you're talking about this, you're talking about Ig Farben. You're talking about creating these chemical nerve agents. You're talking about how these animals were being tested. And the only thing that is going through my mind is Zyklon B and the Holocaust. And I need you to help me with this and explain a bit more how this all interlinks. Because for me, it's, it's giving me chills. Yeah. Okay. So this whole... This whole thing is, uh, is, is, is complex, and I'll try to unpack it for you. So the official, if you will, the official chemical warfare program of the, of the German military is run by the military, which is separate and distinct from the, the SS, the Gestapo, the whole you know, infrastructure for the final solution, the Holocaust. You know. In fact, they're actually quite rivals. You know. uh, the, the, the German army is developing developing this mass production capability to make nerve agents, squandering an awful lot of money on the way. Uh, the relationship of that program to things like the Holocaust uh, is largely that of skimming off skilled labor to work in the factories. Okay, uh, The first nerve agent factory was in this place called Dyhernfurth um, in Silesia. Now it's now, I can't even pronounce the place name in Poland, but it's in Southwest Poland. Uh, now, at the time, it was the German province of Silesia. This place at Dyernfurth used a lot of uh, used a lot of prisoner labor, um, uh, and I have to say, I, by no means apologizing for the, uh, for for the use of prison labor, but by the standards of the time, uh, that this particular labor pool was quite skilled and quite well looked after, as opposed to people in other situations. Uh, and by that, I mean. They used a lot of Polish prisoners of war who were pipe fitters and welders and electricians, okay? Uh, were teaching them fairly sophisticated tasks in this nerve agent factory and didn't want these guys to die and didn't want these guys to down tools after having been you know, taught things. So they were, by the standards of the day, which were admittedly very bad, um, looked after and fed well enough so they could not rebel, they at least do their job and not fall over dead. Uh, so... There's that going on. Now, IG Farben as a whole has got other bad things going on. Uh, IG Farben uh, is running a synthetic rubber factory at a place called Auschwitz, uh, which is using and abusing lots of slave labor in that camp. Uh, but also you get the whole Zyklon B. Now, Zyklon B uh, is, is not a nerve agent. Zyklon B is hydrogen cyanide. And it's hydrogen cyanide that was impregnated onto pellets it was designed as a fumigation agent, okay? So this isn't an official chemical warfare program. This is um, what the pharmacologists would call off-label use. So the, the, the SS is procuring this commercial product, which is meant to for things like fumigating, you know, grain silos and things like that, and using it in an unorthodox and deadly way uh, in, in, its, uh, in its death camps, you know? So... There was a there was a huge bit of uh, you know dispute after the war as to exactly whether Ig Farben knew what that stuff was being used for or not you know so uh, 
I should also st- no, Sorry go ahead. Judge, what's your what's your opinion? Did they know or didn't they? Uh, certainly, certain people did. Uh, you know, there's a there's a there's a character who we have in this story we haven't mentioned yet, who uh, uh, who although he was quite a good chemist, comes off as one of the worst chemists in human history. This guy Otto Ambrose. Uh, Otto Ambrose is literally the A in the acronym SARIN. Okay, um, although he didn't invent it, he just took credit for it. Otto Ambrose was a real go-getter. He was this upper executive at IG Farben. Uh, he was the industrialist behind the chemical warfare program, but also the industrialist behind this synthetic rubber thing going on at this place called the Buna factory, B-U-N-A. Uh, he set up a huge web of arm's length companies. Uh, one of the things I discovered was that this whole, the, the, all this stuff that IG Farben was doing was as much a revenue thing as it was to help the war effort. All right, they were getting rich off of this. Uh, and the directors at IG Farben didn't want to be seen to be directly involved in squalid things like chemical weapons. So they set up lots of joint ventures with, with, with uh, holding companies and a huge web of, you know, intermediate shell companies and things like that. So, for example, the IG Farben factory, you know, that was making the nerve agents, uh, you know, was set up under a shell company called Anorgana. Uh, and the factory itself belonged to Anorgana, but the land belonged to this strange holding company called Montan Work, which was actually a, sh- a sort of a cover company that was owned by the, you know, the, the, the war ministry. So it was a complex web of things. And certain people, Otto Ambos himself included, actually got very rich off the process here because Otto Ambrose, at the, at, he must have worked very hard because he had 19 different salaries on the go during the war. He had a bunch of different jobs because every one of these, every one of these web, uh, web of you know, intermediary companies, holding companies, existed in German law, so had boards of directors and you know, a headquarters somewhere. And, you know, and he, had, he seemed to be a board director or a CEO or a COO of basically all of them. Okay, <laughs> so drawing salaries, I should say. Uh, so, but well, he, got he, paid for, he, he basically selling his soul, but yeah, 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 I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Otto Ambrose in the subject of his soul. That's another whole. You know, I could write a play about that. Uh, but Otto Ambrose, he he also set up the synthetic rubber plant at Auschwitz. He knew what was going on at Auschwitz, and he knew what was going on, uh, yeah, in a lot of places. Now. Part of it was his job was to be the buffer between the executives at IG Farben. He was he was meant to be the guy to absorb all this stuff and just keep the business going. So there was an awful lot of denialism, but that was the purpose. That was the express purpose of guys like Otto Ambrose and this fuzzy web of, of companies. I mean, I found thousands of pages of documents on this stuff at the National Archives in Kew. It would take me five or six German linguists and three or four forensic accountants in the next 20 years to make sense of all this. It's I mean, insane. yeah. Your book isn't just about World War II, though, is it? No, it's an end-to-end story of the nerve agents. And it's, so, start, it's starting at this bit we're talking about and ending with basically contaminated door handles in Salisbury. So talk to us about a bit of the and interim and where you go with the story. Okay. Uh, yeah, not to steal too much of my own thunder, uh, but basically what happens is the Second World War ends. This, the, the Nazis ended up having amassed a very large arsenal of these nerve agents. They didn't use them. I'm not even going to say why, because I have to leave some mystery for the book. But you Absolutely. Guys didn't, yeah. use <laughs> didn't use them. Uh, the, the, the Allies, you know, discover this stuff and are absolutely dumbfounded. That, you know. And so what results there is an arms race because both the East and the West, you know, the, the Western allies, Britain, Britain, France, America, have part of the picture, and the majority of the scientists, because the scientists generally fled West instead of East, uh, the, they have part of the picture, and they have a lot of captured nerve agent. On the other side, the Soviets have got captured nerve agents, some, not a lot. Uh, they have the sort of shattered shells of the the, the, the chemical factories because the, the Red Army captured them and they were partially demolished, but not completely. Uh, they have a smattering of documentation. Uh, they have some, they, and they have some scientists, not many, but some. So both sides 
basically a launch on this chemical arms race on the assumption that the other side is further along in the process. So there's this chemical arms race going on and it doesn't get the same attention that the nuclear arms race has because Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki ended the war. The Russians are absolutely, absolutely, absolutely you know, hell-bent on getting the nuclear bomb. So there's this nuclear arms race going on. But as a subtext below that, there's this chemical arms race as East and West are all racing to make sarin. They took a look at that first nerve agent tab and said, this is okay, but we have enough of this sarin, which is really good stuff. Uh, we really need to make this. Okay, this taboon is just a placeholder until we can get to sarin. And so there's this arms race to get to sarin and everybody's convinced, oh, just one more year and a few more million dollars, yeah, we'll have it cracked. So what you have is this industrial effort that takes a lot longer than anybody ever thought, uh, you know, to, to make sarin. So give you an example, the U.S. built a sarin factory in, in, in outside of Denver, Colorado, a place called Rocky Mountain Arsenal. Um, by the way, it's all gone now. It's a bison sanctuary. Um, but <laughs> they didn't start making sand there until 1952. It took them every bit of seven years from the end of the war. And this is with, you know, the guy that invented it. They had Gerhard Schroeder, who, you know, he, he disgorged thousands of pages of debriefing notes, you know. Uh, Otto Ambrose had sold his soul to the Americans after having sold it, his soul to the uh, to the uh, to the uh, uh, to the Germans, you know, Otto Ambrose sang like a canary too. And even with all that knowledge, actually getting to the mass production of sarin took the U.S. seven years and took every bit of about 11 or 12 for the, uh, for, for the Soviets. But it being the Cold War, each side is convinced that the other side is further along. In reality, the West was further along. It just, it's going to, it's an, so you going to be an epic book, isn't it? Um, can't wait for it yeah. to come out um unfortunately we are going to have to wait a little longer because of uh coronavirus's impacted release date but you're saying august you think we can get it yeah yeah august hopefully late august uh we're looking at a, a possible date for a, a official launch event at rusi on whitehall in early september awesome well we can't oh, wait yeah. Okay. Thank you I'm coming. so I'm much. Flying in with that. Yeah, you may find us like groveling at the front, going, "Dad, remember us?" <laughs> um, but thank you so much for coming on and talking to us about some of this stuff. It's fascinating. Thank you thank so you. much, Dan. All right. Have a nice day. Join us tomorrow when we will be debunking Titanic conspiracy theories with the lovely Inga Shiel. Um, and also, there's so much content coming up. Um, no matter what you're interested in, there is a way for you to get involved. We are having a Hornblower reunion with Yoan Griffith and Jamie Bamber, so get your questions in for them. We are also staging a reunion of the Band of Brothers cast. Um, we've already started releasing names. We have one of the scriptwriters coming too. He wrote episodes two and nine, which for me are two of the absolute best in a standout series uh, so send us your questions for them jason salke is coming back and this time he's bringing all of sharp's chosen men with him so if you've got more questions for the cast of sharp uh, do let us know you can ask me questions uh, i'm gonna eventually be doing a q a so if you've got any questions about world war one or any tv shows or anything that i've done let us know we've also got a q a coming up with um the lovely eleanor janega uh, about medieval women so you can send us questions for that we are going to be talking to gary sheffield who literally wrote the book on douglas haig so if you have got questions about one of the most maligned characters in recent history in britain then give us a shout um, but keep checking our twitter feed as well because there's loads loads more coming up and lots of ways for you to get involved in the show uh, we now also have a patron account as well which is attached to our podbean website um, where you can become a patron donor as little as a dollar a month um, to basically keep us running in the long term um, to cover things like subscription costs um, and compensate people as well like the lovely Steve Smith who's been creating all of our artwork um, while we've been doing this during lockdown so if you want to become a supporter there's various rewards um, for getting involved but you can get to that via historyhack.podbean.com until then stay safe if you possibly can stay at home uh, this is Nighthawk signing off